world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. And for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Son, his love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Sing praise. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. 
Cleanser of the mess I've made Upon the hill our places trace Stretched on across your body crushed By human hands you form from dust How wonderful your mercy is how awesome are your ways I call good morning this is the Northside Church of Christ Bible class time if this is your first time visiting with us online welcome we appreciate your participation if this is your second or third time, we really appreciate you coming back. We're in the book of 1 John. This is an eight-week study of the letters of John and the book of Jude. Just a little bit from last week, we'll back up just half a step. The disciple that Jesus loved near the end of his life, at or about A.D. 85, uh, is going to write uh, three letters to a group of Christians in Western Asia Minor. I think it's important, we talked about a little bit about last week where John was in his life. He's probably 75 or 80, 80 years old. It's been 50 years, perhaps 55, since his Lord and Savior walked on the earth, was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Uh, John has given his entire life to service to his, uh, to his Lord, and he is concerned about uh, false teaching in the first church, and so he's going to take uh, another shot, a couple of shots, at false teachers of that time. John has already written his gospel. We think he did that about AD 85. Uh, this book is a follow-up to that gospel, so it's not surprising at all that the language in the Gospel of John and the language in 1 John are very similar. And John is going to take pains to say, I walked with Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man. I walked with him for three years. I saw what he did. I listened to what he said. He was a man and he was eternal life sent from the Father. I have some things to tell you in this, uh, in this letter and I... I uh, challenge you to doubt my testimony. John is going to be very strong in his language. It was interesting last week, the single message or the first message that John wanted to relay to us, to his audience, what did he 
Uh, how did he summarize everything that the Son of God told him and the rest of the apostles in that three-year ministry? He simply said, profoundly said, God is light. There is darkness, but God is light, and there is no darkness in him. John put a very high value on fellowship. He said, I'm writing this to you so that you can have fellowship with me. And by the way, my fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. This week, uh, I have a target of things that I would like to get done, four particular points. I don't know if we'll get through all four of them, but uh, this is an outline so you can keep track of uh, how we're progressing through uh, this study. John is going to tell us clearly that there are two responses to sin. Not four, not a dozen, there are two. We're going to spend some time on the question of sin and the concept of walking in the light. I think that's going to be a productive part of our study. Then John is going to give us a real-life example, both in AD 85 and here in AD 20, Uh, a real-life example of what walking in the light looks like, and specifically what walking in darkness looks like. And if we have time, we're going to spend uh, a good amount of time on the question of the three temptations available to the master of lies. From where does sin originate? As I was looking over my notes this morning, uh, Karen reminded me that no matter how good my material may be, she would really like for us to read God's Word directly, and I think that's good counsel. So I suggest, I I heartily encourage you to take your Bible. I don't have slides for this, so they're going to show you my picture of reading God's Word, but we should read God's Word together. We're going to read 1 John starting in verse 8, and for this particular section of our class, we'll read through the first 11 verses of chapter 2. So let's read together as the Holy Spirit writes these words. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. A beautiful passage from the Word of God. It's our aim every time that we come together in Bible study to study God's Word I don't pretend to be an expert of the challenges of that day, but I think it is worth a couple of minutes to, uh, to briefly look at the specific false teaching that the Apostle John was addressing. They were a group of uh, intelligent folks, perhaps sincere, probably not in our mind. 
They were called the Gnostics. And these two slides will show us half a dozen things uh, from the material that I looked at. Their principal claim, the most heinous uh, false teaching that they proposed was, was that Jesus was not the Son of God. It was central to their theology that they had to discount Jesus of Nazareth. He was just a man. They also had to do something with the matter of man's flesh, which was obviously evil, and man's spirit. So we're going to talk about that. It was their position that there is uh, the only aspect of mankind that could be saved or enlightened would be his spirit. One conclusion that, that was particularly uh, troublesome to John and to us today was the Gnostic teaching that since the flesh could not be saved, man's flesh, man's human body was so evil that there was nothing to be done, but since the flesh could not be saved, therefore behavior in the flesh was irrelevant. Well, that's a fine position to take. We're going to talk about the mental gymnastics required of false teaching. It occurs to me in Acts chapter 26, verse 8, the Apostle Paul, in one of his public defenses of his life and his belief in Jehovah God, Acts 26, verse 8, reads like this. Why does anyone think it incredible that God raises the dead? That's a beautiful question for us today. When you're studying with someone and they are trying to deal with the power of God, and if they hesitate with the notion that God could raise a man from death, we have to back up a little bit and say the God that we believe in created the universe. He created life. If God created life, then God can revive a man from the dead. He did that with other people in the New Testament. We have stories of that. We have a couple of stories in the Old Testament. But Jehovah God brought his son back from the grave. Three other things that uh, briefly we'll talk about uh, for the Gnostics. Salvation was defined as liberation of the spirit, separate and apart from the body. Now, the key to this salvation, the key to this liberation was special, unique, private knowledge that they had been blessed with, that somehow they had come across this private, sacred knowledge. They also taught that salvation only applies to a man's spirit and then only available to a certain number of elite people. When you consider false teachers, Always look at the fact that the speaker, the false teacher in that person, always considers themselves to be part of their elite. A bit self-serving, to say the least. Because the Gnostics held there to be an elite group, there could not be true fellowship. And it would take John exactly, what, two or three verses to get to that particular falseness that the Gnostics were putting out for John's audience. It did not take John very long to get to one of his biggest beefs with the Gnostics. So let's pick it up where we left off last week, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. I, uh, I like to read, I read a lot, uh, whether for my business or for uh, pleasure, or for my Bible study, look at specifically verses 8 and 9, and look at the way the words appear on the page. Sometimes the logic, the simplicity of God's Word jumps out at you if you will simply look at it. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Box number one, we claim to be without sin. Box number two, if we confess our sins, we is fa- we are, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's a world of material that we could get into there, but the fact of the matter is that they, with regard to the issue of sin, there is just two choices. Just two choices. We can admit we have sin 
or we can claim that we don't have sin. One of my examples last week was the, was the notion of a true-false examination. And, and perhaps I'm hung up on the, that example, and I apologize. But, but Christianity, our life before the Father, our life before uh, people that we are trying to show God's wisdom and His power and might, this is not a, an essay exam. We are living a series of this or that choices. We live in the light or we live in the darkness. It's been the case for 2,000 years, and it continues there today. The Gnostics had to deal with this sin issue. They had a creative uh, vision of it. They just said that uh, sin must be irrelevant because the flesh is so evil. In the first several verses of 1 John, John talks about walking in the light or walking in the darkness. And then specifically in verse 8 and 9, he's going to, to address the issue of sin. And he's going to simplify it for his audience and for us. We have two choices. One choice is a lie. There is no God mentioned in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And there is no deception more fundamental than deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The other option, verse 9, is truth. That truth comes with a promise that God is faithful to forgive. One of the most effective lies in our world today put out by the master of lies, put out by our world culture, is that there are several truths. There is not a single truth. In fact, there may not be truth at all. Or there may be a thousand different truths depending on each individual's circumstance and each individual's view of life. Again, that's a, that requires mental gymnastics to get around uh, several basic issues of life. John, in his gospel, would have no duplicity, no hidden agenda. It's not confusing. In fact, God's law, God's will for us is clear. God's love and his law is easy for us to understand. His purpose is to bless us. My dad had a terrific explanation of life when I was a child. Dad, uh, dad blessed uh, my, myself, my brother, and my sister with a, with a clarity of his walk. My dad would tell me a number of times, this is not hard. If, if you think this is hard, it's because you don't want to understand. And the application of that when I'm studying with someone is that, is that when they look at God's law, now they may need some background. They may, they may need to back up and understand what it is that you already understand as a believer in Christ. But Christianity, the story, the gospel of God's Son is a blessing. It is easy to understand. It does not take an intellectual giant. It does not take secret, special knowledge that only a few people are capable of grasping. God and love and truth will bless us. Satan and hate and lies will curse us. The truth is not hard to understand. Let's continue on then in the first uh, the last verse of chapter 1, verse 10, that I did not put on the slide, so I'll pick it up with verse 10, but then I want to specifically concentrate on 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So we're going to back up and read verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear brothers, my dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. Now, I may, not, I may be the only one in the room that, that, that could be confused by that. Wait a minute, John. You talked about walking in the light. You talked about walking in darkness. You talked about the, that sin exists. There are only two options. I, I either claim that I'm without sin or I confess my sin. And then you tell me that the reason you're writing this letter to me is that I will not sin. 
take a look at what verse 1 does not say. My opinion. 1 John 2 verse 1 does not say this. My dear children, the reason I'm writing you this letter is so that you will be perfect. That somehow by reading my letter to you that you will not make any mistakes in this life. That's not what 1 John 2 1 says. John would not set these people up to fail. Our God did not set us up to fail. If we continue reading in verse 2, back up to verse 1, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. If... The first part of verse 1 had to do with the pursuit of perfection, then that reduces Jesus Christ to an afterthought, to a backup plan. Brothers and sisters, I write you this letter so that you won't make any mistakes, so that you will live a perfect life. But if you mess up, then Jesus will forgive. That's a a misinterpretation of verses 1 and 2. John is specifically addressing the Gnostic false teaching that there is no sin, that behavior in the flesh, that God would find sinful, that that sin is irrelevant because the flesh cannot be saved. The Gnostics preached that there was a special few, that there were elite people that had special knowledge, that their behavior in their life did not matter. They could conduct themselves in really very earthly, worldly, passionate ways and not worry about sin. Paul wrote, the Roman, wrote to the Romans in chapter 3 of that book, we all sin, all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is not a backup plan for those, the rest of us not included in the elite. Jesus is the primary plan for our salvation. He is the only plan for all of us who sin because living without sin is impossible. Sin is real. John wanted to make sure that his audience would not be fooled by false knowledge, by special elite knowledge. And then he gave us a very comforting promise. If we sin, when we sin, we have an advocate. Jesus of Nazareth lived a life. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle John witnessed that life. And now Jesus ascended to the Father and his, his responsibilities to us continue. When we sin, he is our advocate. He is the atonement for our sin. The Gnostics had to deal with this sin issue. We all have to deal with sin. We can deny it. We can dance around it. We can come up with with a a curious, clever, uh, world-based view of sin. John offered a very direct direct teaching about the concept of sin. Our third objective this morning is to talk about sin and walking in the light. I, uh, I, want to, I want to share uh, some information or some content from our Celebrate Recovery Ministry as I try to uh, explain or try to help you understand the, the notion of incidental sin. I, I'm going to say incidental, but I don't mean small. I mean sin as an incidental behavior. So let's take a look at the word relapse. Relapse is a medical term. It's not found in the Bible to my knowledge. The concept of relapse is certainly a biblical concept. It is a stumbling. It is a falling. It is a failure. But in the, in the ministry of recovery, relapse is one word for two very different situations. So let's, let's try to wrestle with this. Uh, I've, I've put this down visually in uh, small print and yellow highlights for occasional sin, for behavior that I regret, 
for behavior that I acknowledge to be not in my recovery walk in God's power, but sinful behavior. Relapse in, the, in that use is inevitable. I will stumble in my recovery walk. Whatever my hurt, hanging up, or habit might be, I'm not pursuing perfection. I am pursuing, I'm walking in the light. I'm, I'm getting better from day to day, but I'm not setting myself, not setting myself up to fail with each and every small caps relapse. Relapse in bold print, red underlined, all caps is repeated behavior, intentional behavior, and when I suffer all caps relapse, I have no interest in confessing. I have no intention to confess. I am, by John's definition, walking in darkness. One word to describe two very different situations. One word that is a matter of the heart. Now, make sure that you don't misunderstand me. We're not talking about big sin and little sin because that's not biblical and that's not something that that our church family would ever pursue, that line of reasoning. There is no little bitty sin as opposed to some great big sin. The concept of relapse would, would... would go to a person's heart and would say the same behavior, big or small, depending on somebody's definition of that word, the same behavior depending on the person's heart. Relapse can be viewed as a, an action that is sinful. It can also apply to a sinful lifestyle, repeated behavior, walking in the darkness. I hope that that will uh, help explain or perhaps help you understand, perhaps, perhaps help me continue with the notion that walking in the light does not require perfection because that is impossible. We have dealt with uh, the two responses available to us concerning sin. We have talked about sin versus walking in the light. We're going, to, uh, we're going to verses 9 through 11, where I believe John is going to get down to the crux of it in very understandable terms. What does it mean to walk in the light when I'm talking about how I'm getting along with a brother or a sister in my church family? Can you imagine that perhaps in the first century they had some stress between brothers and sisters in one or more of the congregations? I can believe that. Can you believe that happens at Northside today? Can you believe that happens in your church family today? Certainly, this is a basic human question, a basic human condition. How am I walking with those people that I serve with and that I love in my church family? John says this in verse 9, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness. Again, north versus south, east versus west, right versus wrong. Am I getting along with my brothers and sisters in a loving way, or do I let behavior on their part or on my part disturb, disrupt that loving, serving relationship And that is called hate. That's called hate within the church family, brothers and sisters, worshiping together, fellowshipping together, serving together, except that we can't get along, except that when I think of you, I don't think positively. I I recall something that you said or something that you didn't do, and you look at me much the same way. You heard me say something, or you saw me do something, and... Between the two of us, things are not loving. I looked at, uh, I looked at something in, in a new way this week as I'm looking at 1 John 2, verse 11. And this will be the end of our class this morning. Take a look at verse 11. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the darkness. John's already said that. 
They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. So when you and I are walking together in serving God, when you and I are doing the best we can do with real life and, and, we, and we stumble a bit, we have a relapse in our personal relationship. And for whatever sinful reason, we don't get to the bottom of it, we don't fix it, that darkness has the power to blind us to the rest of our walk. I'll leave it there this morning. I'd like to go to our last slide because I'll give you your assignment for next week. The slide will say 1 John 3 and 4. We didn't get far enough to to go there. So stay with 1 John 2 and 3. That is my telephone number and my personal email. I solicit your feedback to the class. It blesses me and it will enable me to improve the class going forward. Thank you for your participation. God bless you in your walk this week. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name, every blessing you pour out I turn back to praise, when the darkness closes in Still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, on a road marked with suffering, where there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name, every blessing you pour out I turn back to praise, when the darkness closes in Still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say. Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, Mike, test, 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 test. blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Good morning. I'm so glad you've joined us here today. In case you don't know me, my name is Mark Yakeley. I'm the involvement minister here at Northside, and I also lead our missions committee. I can't see you, but I know you're there because every week we get a report 
that tells us how many devices are viewing our live streaming service. And every week, we know that more and more are tuning in. As you can see from this map here, I think, let's see if that's working. That's not working. Why is that not working? There we go. Whoop, I went too far now. There, let's try this again. As you can see from this map here, viewers are watching from all over. And I have a strong suspicion that among those joining us today are some of Northside's missionaries. Because today is our annual Missions Sunday. You know, in some ways, Mission Sunday is like any other Lord's Day. We are here to worship God. But we're also here to get updates from those missionaries. It's kind of like when Paul got back from one of his missionary journeys and stopped in at the church in Antioch that sent him out and gave a report on what he was doing. The missions presentation that you're going to see this morning is primarily for Northside members. But I really think all of you will be blessed to see how they are spreading the gospel around the world. Northside members, because you're not here today, things are going to be a little bit different. Normally in the foyer, you will see posters with pictures of our missionaries. Uh, you'll see flags hanging from the ceiling uh, with, uh, that are from every uh, different country that we do mission work in. Uh, you'll, you'll watch our children walk down the aisle and, and give their money to one of our missionaries. But you know, despite all those differences, really, our, our missionaries are still working. They're still on the job, and they still need your support. We've been working hard the past few weeks to make uh, videos of each of our missionaries, and I'm excited to show you those later today. And tonight, if you'll join us for Sunday Night Live... Now show the screen, boys. Uh, join us for Sunday Night Live. we got a special treat for you. Most of our missionaries are actually going to be there with us. Check this week's bulletin, if you will, to find instructions on how to get into that meeting. I hope to see you there. And now let's worship God. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. With my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Holy and true, great are you, Lord, most holy. Holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O oh, Holy Lord, most Holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing, with my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Holy and true, great are you, Lord, most Holy Spirit. 
you join me as we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful, Lord, for this time that we have together as Christians around the world to worship you, to praise you, Lord. You are our mighty creator, our Father, and we are blessed to be called your children. Lord, we specifically want to pray for the missionaries around the world, especially those that um, uh, we support here at Northside. Lord, we ask that you bless the Vic family in, in Scotland and their efforts there. That you'll be with the floods in Minnesota. That you'll also be with Jonathan Hannigan down in Argentina. That you'll be with Roberto and Betty Zapata and all those connected with Eleb down in Mexico. And especially for the World broadcasting, uh, world Christian broadcasting group, uh, reaching areas of the world that are difficult uh, through traditional missionary means. We ask that you bless those efforts. Lord, we're just grateful for the for the elders here at Northside and what they're doing to uh, stay connected with all of us, their care, and uh, we ask that you continue to, to give them wisdom, Lord, and direction. Lord, we also ask that you be with each of us that uh, in our daily lives that you will. Help us to, to be missionaries to those that we, that we, that we meet, especially uh, in the challenges that we face today. Lord, we just ask you to continue to be with each of us here and um, that you'll continue to bless the efforts of all the missionaries around the world and continue to bless Northside. In the solutions name we pray, amen. Jesus had been on a very long journey he was tired, he was thirsty. He came to a well and he had nothing to draw the water with. A Samaritan woman came to the well and Jesus asked her, will you give me a drink? The woman said, how can you ask me for water? I'm a Samaritan and you are a Jew. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him if he would give you living, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is just one beautiful example of how Jesus describes his boundless, unending love for all who choose him. Boundless love, unending joy, this is my life, it's what I know, I can't believe that he selected me, Jesus my Lord, it's you I In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, 
eat. This is my body, for which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We join together this morning to worship God, and as Paul said, to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, His Son. And when I say, and God's Son, and when I say join together, I just don't, I don't mean just all of you in Wichita. As Mark stated, there are, there are people all over the U.S. that are joining us today. Um, all of us together are remembering the sacrifice of Christ. We are communing together. This morning, especially in the strange times we are living in, though, it's helpful to remember what we are doing ties us not only to those here online today, not only to the U.S., but to the brothers and sisters around the globe who are in communion with us together in the Lord. I like to think of it as New Year's Eve. As you think of New Year's Eve, every hour of the night, another place celebrates the coming New Year with celebration and fireworks in different people's homes across the world. When we take the Lord's Supper, we partake in a beautiful cascading ribbon of believers across the globe who are communing with the Lord and celebrating His sacrifice and resurrection. After hour after hour, if you think about it, it's almost for a complete day every week people are communing with the Lord in this way. At 8 p.m. our time last night, the believers in Haruna, Japan, proclaim the death of Christ together. At 2 a.m. this morning, our time in Mahajanga, Madagascar, the home of one of World Christian Broadcasting's radio stations, the believers there celebrated the gift of eternal life bought with Christ's blood. At 4 a.m. this morning, our time, Robin and Chrissy Vick and the believers in Falkirk, Scotland, remembered the body of Christ freely given for us. At 8 a.m. this morning, our time, Jonathan Hannigan and the believers in Buenos Aires participated in the blood and body of Christ. And right now, the brothers and sisters in Toluca, Mexico, with us are perceiving the Lord's body and thanking Him for redemption. About three hours from now, Alex and Aaron Flood and the believers in St. Paul, Minnesota, will remember the blood and body of Christ together. Like a wave of gratitude and love surging over the world, we join with Christians around the globe in celebrating what only the perfect Son of God could have done for us. So if you, if you personally in your home or with your small group of believers together take the bread and the fruit of the vine, remember that we are proclaiming His resurrection. We are proclaiming His personal sacrifice that He made for each of you, for each of us, to forgive our sins. And we are doing it together with God's faithful across the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we take this time to take the bread which represents your body, Lord, your body given in a terrible death on the cross, or your body was whipped, a crown of thorns was placed on its head. And Lord, you gave that all for us, that suffering and that shame because of what we have done in this life, Lord. Lord, then your blood was shed, your perfect, pleasing, and good blood that we do not deserve, Lord. But because of that, we have forgiveness of sins through your sacrifice. As we take the fruit of the vine, let us perceive the blood, and that it takes blood to pay for sin, as you've told us. But Lord, we thank you for all these things. We pray them in your holy name. Amen.
the azure blue. A god concealed from human sight, he tinted skies with heavenly hue, and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, there is a God. he is alive. I really believe that we at Northside are doing that. Of course, we can always do better, but we are active in spreading the good news locally throughout the U.S. and throughout the entire world. Locally, we talk to our friends and neighbors about the gospel. We have coffee shop Bible studies. Uh, we are active in supporting one of our local schools near the Northside building, Pleasant Valley Elementary, with several uh, outreach projects every year. And of course, our Celebrate Recovery ministry is a great way that we reach out to the community here at Northside. We spread the gospel throughout the U.S. Uh, our Know Your Bible television program for more than three decades has shared the gospel, the good news of Jesus on television, and many thousands of people have taken our Bible correspondence courses uh, through the mail and continue to do so every, every day. We have 50 different graders that grade those lessons. And, of course, uh, the floods in Minnesota are another example of the way we're spreading the gospel throughout the U.S. And then throughout the world, we have mission works in, alphabetically here, Alaska, Argentina, Madagascar, Mexico, and Scotland. This church has been active in missions for a long, long time. But 14 years ago, our elders decided that we really needed to do better at doing mission work. Their plan was then, and still is today, that we need to, to focus on a small number of works in a big way so that we could really get to know our missionaries well and support them and get to just uh, you know, do everything we can to help them. Our regular budget does not, does not include missions, just like, as it is with Know Your Bible. Uh, we uh, ask you once a year to tell us how much you want to support missions, and, and uh, you choose to do that every year. Now, we do have ongoing commitments to our missionaries, so we do have a giving goal that we're going to tell you about. But we need to hear from you. We need to know how much you still believe in what we're doing and want it to continue. Today is our 14th annual Missions Sunday. Northside members, yesterday I emailed you a missions brochure. I encourage you to read that brochure and learn more about our missionaries and about our giving goal for the next 12 months. You know, our children really love to learn about missionaries. The teachers in their classes talk about missions a lot. 
The children can tell you who our missionaries are and where they live. They pray for our missionaries. They bring money to help them with their work. The other day we asked some of them where they would go if they could do mission work anywhere in the world someday. I want you to hear what they had to say in this first video that we're going to watch right now. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Daddy. If you could be a missionary and go anywhere, where would you go? To, to, to the caves. To the caves? Okay, what would you do there? I would, I would, I would get my, my arrows, ice, my snow sword, and, and get, and find some snow monsters. You could find snow monsters with your snow sword? I would start in America because the Bible says if you're new, just start right where you are. I would stay here and be a missionary and I would teach people about God. Probably Ireland. Ireland? What would you do in Ireland? I'd teach people who don't know about Jesus about what he did and how he did it and how that impacts our lives. I would go to Africa. And why is, um, I like the weather there. I've been there before and I really like it. And there's a lot of babies there that need help and I, and I want to help them. Probably California because there's a beach and I can teach a lot of people about God. I think I would go to Italy because, one, they have a cool accent there. Two, they eat cookies for breakfast. And three, they have cool city. No, three, they have cool cities like Venice. I would go to Egypt. To Africa. Mexico. Probably stay somewhere in the U.S. Probably, uh, maybe Colorado. New York. Probably to Alaska. Florida. Because there's the most people there. Hi, Solomon. How was your day? <laughs> it's good. Hey, I got a question. Um, if you could be a missionary anywhere in the world, where would you go? All sorts of places. Yeah, what would you do? Give people Bibles so huh? they can learn about God. If you were a missionary and could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Space! Space? What would you do in space? Come on, I'm going to be really... Hi. Jump on the moon really high? Yeah, jump on the moon really high. Ooh, well, that's crazy. Oh, don't you just love our children and their love for missions and love for God and spreading the word? Over the past month, I have been working with all of our missionaries to produce videos to give you an update on the works that they're doing. And I asked them this time if they would specifically focus on one person in their congregation that they have really had a big impact on. So I want to start uh, by hearing from Alex and Aaron Flood in St. Paul, Minnesota. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Hi, Northside. We want to tell you about the many good things that God is doing here in Minnesota. But first, We'd like to focus on someone who has come to Christ through our work and through your faithful support of our work. Her name is Zane Banks. Zane was the first person we studied with, and shortly afterwards she was baptized in 2015. Over the last five years, Zane has been an active member of our congregation. She is very evangelistic, inviting people to visit our church. Last year, Zane was married to a childhood friend in her home country of Sierra Leone, Shortly after her marriage, Zane realized that in about nine months, she would be welcoming a new baby into the world. Though Zane was scheduled for a C-section, her water broke four days early on February 6th. She immediately called Aaron for help and had an emergency C-section that evening. Aaron never left her side. Serious complications arose after the baby was delivered and Zane needed multiple follow-up surgeries and blood transfusions. There were moments where we and the doctors feared for her life, but by the grace of God, she made a miraculous recovery. I want to thank Aaron, Aaron Flood. She has been the rock. I just looked at her, I'm like, are you gonna be here when I come back? 
And she kept telling me, I will be here. After a week-long stay in the hospital, Zane was released, and she, her new baby Ada, and her nine-year-old daughter Amarachi came and stayed with us for two and a half weeks while Zane continued to recover. Having her open her home for me to come in, she took care of me so I could come back, be able to stand back on my feet. I just want to thank her, and I'm, I'm grateful to have her. After she recovered, Zane's greatest need was to have a reliable car. We put out a request to Christians in Kansas, and you responded by giving over $2,000. Members of the Lake Phelan Church donated another $2,000. So together, we raised over $4,000 so that Zane could make a down payment on a reliable car. Thank you for the car. All of you, I pray that God will continue to bless you and, and replenish you in everything that you do for giving us the opportunity to not drive in a broken car, to have something reliable with my family. I hope that it gives you as much joy as it gives me to see the impact that the church has been able to make on Zane's life and her family. Now let me share a few updates about our work. Most Sundays, we have about 12 to 14 people at our worship service. Before worship each Sunday, we enjoy a fellowship meal together. We also now have several men who are capable of teaching, preaching, and leading the congregation. Over the years, we've been able to use our meetup Bible study as a way to consistently meet people who want to study the Bible. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, all of the coffee shops have been closed, and so we've had to put a hold on our weekly coffee shop Bible studies. The Lake Phelan Church of Christ is small, but we are growing. Many of our members have been part of our church now for several years. If everyone were to come here on the same Sunday, we would have over 20 people in attendance. One reason for our growth is that many of our members are starting to invite more friends and family to attend with them. From the Flood family to your family, we thank Northside for your support and encouragement as we work to grow the church in Minnesota. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. Wasn't that a powerful testimony from Zane about how important Alex and Aaron have been in her life? Our next missionaries are Robin and Chrissy Vick. They and their team moved to Scotland 10 years ago and planted a church in Falkirk. And uh, that church is now a strong body of believers. Let's watch their video. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hey guys, hope and pray that you're well. As a family, we count ourselves blessed beyond measure and we continue to be incredibly thankful for your partnership with us in our work here in the Falkirk area. We thank you for your prayers, your love, your care, and your support for us here in our work. We wanted to take the chance to highlight one of our members in this video for you and introduce you to our sister Marjorie Wilson, who is an incredible encouragement to our congregation with her servant heart. Marjorie grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, at the height of the Troubles, otherwise known as the Northern Ireland conflict, between the IRA, who opposed British rule, and other factions that were in favour of it. Marjorie was converted as a teenager at a congregation in Belfast and later met and married a Scotsman, so she relocated to the Falkirk area in the 70s, where they settled and began a family. Many years later, after a number of different circumstances in her life, Marjorie became estranged from her family and she walked away from her relationship with the Lord. As she says, she was in the world for a long period of time, but people were praying for her and that though she had let go of God, he hadn't let go of her, and he had ways of bringing her back. There wasn't a Church of Christ in the Falkirk area until our team arrived to do the church plant, and through word of mouth we were able to reconnect with Marjorie, who was at a point where she was truly seeking God again. Marjorie's story is a beautiful picture of grace and mercy, and we are truly thankful for her servant heart and for being part of our community of faith here at the Falkirk Church of Christ. 
It's a strange time at the moment due to events surrounding COVID-19. However, as a church family, we're still finding opportunities to gather. Even though it's online, we continue to meet as the church, the people of God. And we look forward to the time when we can resume our coffee shop Bible studies again that we host regularly in the community, both in Falkirk and Glasgow, as well as resuming our children's ministry, which provides so much joy to our congregation. Up until the quarantine situation, we were continuing to have a very active Sunday school programme on a Sunday evening with multiple kids' classes and a meal for our families, as well as a time of worship and praise. We look forward to being able to see each other again in person and gather together as the saints in Falkirk. In addition to that, we're carrying on with our regular ministries, at least to the best of our ability. Through this past year, I've been involved with a Bible study called Alpha, which is a community-based video series and Bible discussion designed for seekers interested in learning more about God. It's been a really amazing opportunity. I've also organized all of the Bible lessons and curriculum for the annual Field of Refuge retreat last year and um, was planning to do so again this year. Robin continues to be involved with the board for the European Christian Workshop, and last year was incredibly encouraging. Unfortunately, we're having to cancel our events for this year due to the coronavirus situation. However, we'll plan on offering some of the sessions online, and we'll be focusing on next year. Our personal Bible studies, um, Robin's study with people like Andy and mine with people like Tracy, are continuing to happen, though we're currently doing it online rather than in person. Please pray for our various methods of planting the seeds of the gospel in people's hearts here. And just as a little update on my own health, I want to thank you all for your prayers, and I'm really happy to report that I'm feeling so much better, and each week I seem to gain a little more strength since starting my thyroid medication at the end of last year. Thank you so, so much for praying for me, and i um, so grateful to God for being able to get back to doing more for my family and for our ministry here. Um, thanks again, we love you guys. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. When the Vicks were here last summer, do you remember praying for Christy's health? I think God has answered those prayers in a big way, and we're, we're thankful to him for that. Now let's hear from Jonathan Hannigan in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus Hello, Northside family. Thank you so much for the support you've given me over the last 14 years, first in Venezuela and these last nine years here in Buenos Aires, Argentina. In 2013, I planted a church that met in my apartment for four years. And then in 2017, we had a large enough group that we started meeting in a church building we're sharing with another congregation. We now average 35 people at our worship services. Our church normally meets at 6 on Sunday afternoons, but during quarantine, we've been meeting online at 1030 so our families from other countries can tune in to our worship services. Our church recently held its annual retreat, and Butch and Patricia Sandoval from Bolivia were with us. Butch gave a great series of lessons on the church. We had 35 in attendance, a record for us. During the first half of this year, Oscar and Francia are working with us as missionary interns. They are students at the Baxter Institute in Honduras, and our church has fallen in love with them. I've enjoyed mentoring them and seeing them grow. Once the quarantine is over, I hope they will return to Buenos Aires to work with me after they graduate. While I'm stuck at home, I've been teaching Bible studies on Zoom with my other interns and with church members. A few days ago, we had a live conversation about theology with over 300 people in participation. We're having to find new ways to reach out to people during this time. I run two book clubs online that are also going well. One is a Christian book club and people from many different churches attend. I've been studying the Bible with one of the young men who attends. My other book club is for people who want to read and discuss secular literature. Sometimes I meet people who are looking for spiritual answers as well. Now I'd like to introduce you to someone who is a strong Christian, in part because of the work that you support here. Buenos días, familia. ¿Cómo están? Estoy aquí con nuestra hermana Vanessa eh, de Bolivia y ella nos va a contar un poco de su historia y de su caminar con Jesús. Mi nombre es Vanessa, como dijo, soy de Bolivia. Mi caminar con Jesús comenzó no sabiendo mucho de Jesús, porque 
No soy de una familia cristiana. ¿Y cómo te ha ayudado la iglesia acá en Buenos Aires a crecer en tu fe? Bastante, muchísimo. Y ya que te has capacitado más, ¿cómo has podido compartir tu fe? Tanto con hermanos como con personas no cristianas. Haciendo lo mismo que hicieron conmigo, relacionándome con los otros. Como dije, entré a una iglesia un día y la gente me trató diferente. Para ellos yo era bienvenida y me abrazaban. Yo no entendía eso, ahora lo entiendo. ¿Cómo puedo compartir con ellos siendo yo? Pero tratando de pensar en que si soy la única persona que conozcan o que conozcan algo de Jesús a través de mi vida, bueno, tratar de ser Jesús. Muchas gracias por tu tiempo. De nada. Vanessa's daughter, Brittany, is also an active member of our church and was baptized this last year. Vanessa studied for three years at the Argentine Bible Institute, where I taught. She is very active in evangelism as well, encouraging brothers and sisters to walk with Jesus. Thank you again for your support of God's work here in South America. It's because of you that many people here have a relationship with Christ. God bless you. Here we now his love proclaim. I think it's neat to hear about people like Vanessa that Jonathan has had a big impact on. I got to meet her when I visited Jonathan uh, a few years ago down in Buenos Aires. And I th I'm so excited about Oscar and Francia. I know Jonathan is too. They will graduate, I believe, uh, in December of this year. And he is really praying that they will return and work with him full time. And, and uh, if that's what God's will is, uh, let's all pray for that. Because they, they have proven already in just the short time they've been there to be a big help uh, for him and the church there. For the past 27 years, we have supported mission work in Toluca, Mexico. It all started when these three missionary families uh, from the U.S. planted a church there. That church now has 300 members, and Northside supported Jody Jones and his family, and they're pictured in, on the left there. Later, that team of uh, missionaries started a school that was a branch of the Sunset International Bible Institute in Lubbock. They named the school the Latin American Bible Institute, and it goes by its initials, I-L-E-B. Let me share a few statistics with you about the school. ELAB has established 20 extension schools. The number of students uh, has been growing lately, especially in the, their online programs. And ELAB now has uh, students in Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, and Panama. Since the time that ELAB was founded, about 200 students have graduated from the main location there in Toluca, and hundreds more have graduated from the branch schools. An amazing 88% of the graduates are now active in 50 different congregations around Latin America. And graduates from the school have planted 30 churches. During the pandemic, classes are continuing, but they're all online now. ELEB's director sent us a short video from one of the students uh, uh, at ELEB. Her name is uh, Itzar Mendoza, and uh, I'd like to ha have you hear what she has to say now. Mendoza, and I am a second year student at the ELEB. Uh, I want you to know that being in the Institute for me, it has been a great experience because it has strengthened my faith, and above all, it has prepared me to better serve our God. Uh, thanks to this, I have been able to support the youth in the Luca Church of Christ. I try to guide them and advise them according to the scriptures in their relationship with God. I really thank God and thank you for giving me this opportunity because it has brought so much joy to my life. I want to continue serving the Lord for the rest of my life and I want to help more people to know how wonderful and how amazing it is to live with Christ. Thanks again for your generosity. I wish you the best, and God bless you. Bye. How neat. I, I think Itzar was saying what a lot of ELEB students would say, that studying at ELEB has strengthened her faith and better prepared her to serve God. And as an example, she is now working with the youth group there at the Toluca Church of Christ. 37 years ago, World Christian Broadcasting built a shortwave radio station in Alaska and four years ago, they added one in Madagascar. And with these two radio stations, they blanket the globe with radio programs that include news, music, and Christian teaching. 
baptized, you have a saving experience ahead of you. We follow Jesus. The message is timeless, and World Christian Broadcasting uses radio to send it everywhere. Now, digital technology adds a new dimension. I bring you warm greetings from the International Hall. Broadcasting via stations KNLS in Alaska and Madagascar World Voice and webcasting via the Internet, World Christian Broadcasting sends a message of God's amazing grace over the air and online in seven languages. That amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. This program is a production of World Christian Broadcasting. Once we get the listener's attention with the use of pop music and stories of universal interest, that opens the door to Bible teaching. While much of our content is on the Internet, many parts of the world do not have web access or have the Internet restricted by the government. Our over-the-air broadcasts make use of the shortwave band of frequencies, which skip off the atmosphere, thus permitting long-distance transmission. Radio signals cross the borders of nations whose governments are hostile to Christianity. Shortwave radio sets are widespread and capable of picking up stations like ours. A listener can hear a shortwave broadcast in private in a repressive country. Or in a free country, entire communities can gather around a shortwave radio in villages that do not have FM radio, television, or the Internet. We thank you for your continued prayers and support. Tell you what, World Christian Broadcasting is an amazing ministry. Just think about all the people who live in repressive countries where they're not, they're not free to worship their Christianity openly. Uh, and in fact, they might even get in trouble if they listen to a broadcast like that. But they can do that inside their own home, uh, privately listen to shortwave radio. And you know, a lot of people in the world don't have access to the internet. But it's amazing how many people do have shortwave radios. So World Christian is a, is a neat ministry. And by the way, Andy Baker, who you saw at the, the end of the video there, the president of World Christian, will be joining us tonight for Sunday Night Live uh, along with our other missionaries. So I look forward to getting to speak with him and, and all of them. Every year, the children in our five-year-old through fourth grade classes bring money for one of our missionaries. And then on Mission Sunday, some of the kids present the money to us so that we can give it to our missionary. For the past few years, we've been sending their donations to Alex and Aaron Flood. There they are. Uh, last year, the Floods told me that they used the money in several ways. First of all, to buy Bibles and books for members and guests, and then to also buy food to share with those who meet for worship at their house on Sundays. And Alex said they also purchased some Bible study books for him to be able to continue to learn. This year, the pandemic slowed down this project a little bit, so the amount is lower than in years past, but they still managed to raise $143. I know you're all proud of our children and their love for missions. If you've had a chance to look at the Mission Sunday brochure that I emailed yesterday to our members, you know that our giving goal for the next 12 months is $164,817. That's a lot of money, but that's what we need to keep supporting our missionaries. And it really helps us if you'll tell us how much you plan to give to missions. So I'm going to take a few minutes here and tell you how to do that. If you are set up to use Realm, our church database, we would like for you to submit your pledge there. That's a new thing we're doing this year, but I think it'll work really great. If you prefer to get into Realm on a computer, just go to onrealm.org, and then when, once you're in Realm, click on the giving uh, menu option there on the left, and then click on the pledge tab on the next screen. And then when you get to the pledge now screen, uh, here's how you do it. First of all, you enter the amount that you'd like to give, and then you enter the frequency that you would like to give it. 
You can do it all at one time. You can do it weekly, monthly, every two months, every three months, or even as you can. Then specify the date that you plan to start your pledge and the date that you plan to end. And then at the end of that sentence there, you'll see uh, what uh, Realm has calculated to be the total amount that you'll give for the year. Make sure that's right, and then click on Save Pledge. And it will save that pledge into our system, and we'll add it in with all the other pledges. Now, some of you prefer to use the Realm Connect app on a smartphone, and I'll show you how to do it. And these examples are on an iPhone. It's a little different on an Android phone. First of all, you click on the giving icon on the bottom of the screen. Then you click the pledge button at the top. Then click on make a pledge. And then you fill out the pledge the same as you do on the computer. First of all, you enter how much you want to give. You enter the frequency, the start date, the end date. Make sure the total is correct for the year that you plan to give. And then click on save pledge. Now this may look a little complicated, but believe me, it's not. It's very simple. But if you have any questions about this, any troubles, feel free to give me a call or call the church office and they'll be happy to help you. This afternoon I plan to send all Northside members an email reminding, of you, reminding you of how to uh, submit a pledge in Realm. And for those of you, sorry guys, I messed up there. Uh, for those of you who are less technically inclined, uh, you, you can also just reply to that email and fill out a pledge form that I will have in the email itself and, and send that in. Or give us a call. We'll be happy to take your pledge over the phone. We'll take it however you want to give it to us. As we wrap up this morning, I think it would be good to hear what our children think our missionaries do and what they believe a good day for a missionary would look like. And if you were a missionary, what would your best day look like? It would look like our house. It would look like our house? Yeah. Well, that's fun. Okay, can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Tell people about God. Spending their day with God. That's a great answer. Thanks, Solomon. You're welcome. When a million people turn to God. After the church is set up and a lot of people are coming to the service. Getting to get someone to go to their church. Like when everybody's just like bunching up around them and they're like, Please, please, tell me about God, please! A whole bunch of people at the church. Like a good day for me if I was a missionary would probably be like lots of people getting baptized. Hmm. What would your best day as a missionary be like? Hmm? Um, probably when I realize that lots of people have turned to Christ or there are a bunch of poor people that have been taken care of. Getting a few people together and having a sort of small group maybe and teaching a group of 10 to 20 people about Jesus, hmm? that would be pretty good. Getting a new baby. Um, getting getting a package from a um from your family from far away. I would teach people about God and eat lunch, eat dinner with some friends. Telling people about God and then listening to me, and then if I ask them a question and they answer it right, that would make me really happy. Now, what would their best day be like? <coughs> like. Riding a train and a horse at the back. Like riding a train and a horse at the back? Mm-hmm. I love it. Thanks, Hannah. Is Yeah. Is the video done? Yeah. Can I get out of the chair? Sure. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think someday Hannah's going to be a missionary somewhere. Maybe go to Japan like her parents did. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul said, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I wonder if our, our missionaries ever become weary. Their job is a hard one. You know, we've been supporting missions for a long time. I wonder if any of us have ever become weary, especially now since we have so many new challenges because of the pandemic. I want to encourage you, as the Apostle Paul did, 
to hang in there. He didn't say hang in there exactly, but I think that's what he meant. Precious souls are being saved all around the globe because of you. Won't it be great someday to have, uh, to someday in heaven to bump into somebody who is there because you cared enough to support missions? When Jesus sent out his apostles in Matthew chapter 10, he told them in verse 7, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And then in verse 9 he said, Freely you have received, freely give. God has blessed you in many ways. I encourage you to freely support the work of our missionaries around the globe. Let's close in prayer. Lord, it has been good to check in with our missionaries this morning and just see what they're doing and uh, see the amazing ways that they are spreading the gospel for you around the world. I pray, Lord, that you will touch each of our hearts to, to pray for our missionaries, to stay in contact with them, and to support them financially. We love you, God. We thank you that you have blessed us with, the, with enough money and uh, with the desire to support missions the way we do. And we pray that we'll be able to continue this work and expand it uh, as we go forward. We love you, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share His love as He told about you, but Mission Sunday is one of the most encouraging days of the year for me. I, during each and every one of those videos, I found a time I just couldn't help but smile to think about the hearts of those missionaries, uh, the effect they're having on people's lives. Um, it's just it's amazing to experience just a small portion of what they do day in and day out. We, af- we often ask ourselves, how can we participate in spreading the gospel locally and around the world? But Paul reminds us that we are one body. In Romans 12, 4 through 5, he says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. In Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. We all have unique gifts, we all have unique roles to play, uh, but financially supporting the Lord's work is one of the main ways that every single one of us can play a role in God's work here locally and abroad. As, as a former missionary abroad and now working locally more myself, I know one of the biggest gifts we can give our missionaries is to set them free financially so they can work solely, focus all their work on the Lord's work and not have to worry about putting together that support all the time. I want to thank all of you for supporting the work. Northside has been very faithful 
And we also want to thank you for supporting the work locally. We have many giving options locally here for our weekly contribution. Um, you can mail in your giving. You can go online to use the app, the website, or even text. And uh, we thank you for continuing to do that. I'd like to close this morning with an encouragement from the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We have a temptation and an opportunity this week. The temptation is to join in with all the negativity we see around us. But I want to encourage you all to resist that temptation and take the opportunity instead. Take the opportunity to find something pure, something noble, something praiseworthy. Make that what you talk about with your neighbors, with your kids, with your friends. I want you to share with everyone around you. Maybe you can make a phone call, a text, a card, or an email, and if that happens to be to one of our missionaries, even better. Let's all focus on what's praiseworthy this week as we did through all these videos to see what God is working, because He is still active and still working in our local communities and around the world. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the opportunity to partake in Your work, whether it's through our personal evangelistic Bible study efforts, whether it's through encouragement of the saints, whether it's through teaching and preaching inside the church, whether it's welcoming new Christians in and making them feel welcome, whether it's taking them into the family and teaching them, Lord. There's so many pieces and parts, so many places that we can serve you, Lord, in every way and be a part of your body and a part of your work. Reveal those ways to us, Lord. Show us specifically how we can serve, and we thank you for those opportunities this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. We delight in the love you were, we delight in the Son who was perfect from birth, we delight in the day. Returning to earth, hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah, hallelujah. We will bow our hearts because we are free as we raise our hands to give you glory, Father of life and of love, an infinite word. We're delivered by blood that flows from the tree, draws near to you. Vessels of your mercy before the invention of man, the glorious Trinity. We delight in the law of your word. We delight.
delight in the Son who was perfect from birth. We delight in the day he's returning to earth. Hallelujah. 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 We will lift our eyes to the cloud and the flame. Lord, you guide our steps and restore us again. The nations of men will rejoice in the God of the wilderness. We delight in the law of your word. We delight in the Son who was perfect from birth. We delight in the day he's returning to earth. Hallelujah. 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 perfect from birth. We delight in the day he's returning to earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.